These Southern California hills have produced some of the most valuable mineral finds in the history of American mining. Stones like pink tourmaline, so fashionable, it fueled the desire of a foreign dynasty. Kunzite, a mineral so delicate, the light of day could make it fade, but so beautiful, it would turn a jewelry company into an icon. And one find that would change the mineral collection world forever. I'm Thomas Nagin, and I'm a mineral explorer. I'm the guy that supplies museums, galleries, and private collectors with world-class pieces of nature's art. Come along with us as we travel the globe in search of rare gems, crystals, and other fine minerals. It's not always easy, but it's always an adventure. La Jolla means jewel, and the seven caves of La Jolla are tourist hot spots for the geologically curious. Can you tell us a little bit about the, uh, the caves here? And they're kind of eroded from a 75 million year old Cretaceous sediment, uh, so about the time of dinosaurs, and in fact, they found dinosaur bones there. So they found hydrosaur bones in one of the caves here. Yeah, and stuck in the sediment in one of the caves, and it was just starting to erode out as the cave was eroded from a 75 million year old Cretaceous sediment. It was like a big duck-billed dinosaur, right? Yeah, there was a whole family of hadrosaurs, and this was just one of them. It wasn't long until we saw firsthand how powerful the sea needs to be to carve stone. And with a little courage, I was rewarded with an exhilarating feeling of connecting both with the earth and the sea. Nature's art is all around us, sometimes in the form of a rock, and many times in the form of a painted sky. Do you know anything about crystals or minerals? Oh, sorry, I don't, I don't know about this. Do you know anything about them? Um, I mean, not, not too much. I don't know anything about minerals. Very little. It seems like history has faded, even though there are signs on every corner. Just up the coast in Carlsbad, California, is a world-renowned nonprofit, the Gemological Institute of America the longest established educational and research institute of gemology in the world. Over the last 85 years, they've educated 350,000 jewelry professionals. They set the standard for diamond grading and are an independent organization dedicated to educating the public and trade on all things gems and jewelry. We're actually sitting here with, uh, with Kyla. Kyla is a former uh, GIA student, a GIA graduate. So she can actually tell you from the inside what it was like to study here. Every single day you are here for six months and you have to go through and grade and look through stones while you're here from eight to three every day. So you're under the microscope identifying all the different properties of all the different types of gemstones, really learning to be able to identify how to rule other stones out to be able to come to the conclusion of what you're looking at. The four C's, is that right? Yes. What does that stand for? It's cut, clarity, color, and carat weight. So you're really judging the dimensions of the gem. You're judging what color it is. For diamond, it's typically the, the less color is the better. And the number of inclusions you can see at, at 10 power. You can actually identify stones with the inclusions. Mm -hmm. They are so important for us mm -hmm. because when a gemstone grows inside the earth, it captures other minerals inside it. It captures little pieces of liquid from the growth environment, and those can tell us so much about how the stone grew, even how old it is. Every diamond, every natural diamond, no matter how modest, it can be a tenth of a carat or 20 carats. It's a product of the earth. It's probably up to a billion or older in terms of years, 
and it grew an, in unimaginable depths deep below our feet. Can you tell us what makes a, uh, a good tourmaline? Tourmalines grow in, in, an, in an environment where there's a lot of liquids around. They grow in rocks called pegmatites. Pegmatite, a rock made up of several minerals, quartz, feldspar, and sometimes mica. It's the primary indicator that other valuable collector specimens could be present or nearby, such as aquamarine, tourmaline, or kunzite. It's very hard to predict where they're going to, uh, going to form. So the miners are kind of spinning a roulette wheel all the time. Will they hit a big pocket? Will it be barren? But in rare circumstances, uh, you know, you get fantastic, absolutely unbelievable pieces. All these minerals, they're unique, they're rare, they connect us with the Earth, they connect us with the history of the planet. They are truly the treasures of the Earth. We're headed to see Jeff Swanger, who knows firsthand the riches this region can give the patient miner. I live in Paula, California, right in the middle of Pegmentite District. To the west of us, we have the Stewart, the Tourmaline Queen, Paula Chief, which is right below this deck. Pala Chief is the birthplace of a mineral named after Dr. Kuntz of the famed Tiffany's Jewelry Store. And this rare American gem would become the centerpiece of a signature ring sold exclusively by this now iconic American brand. This is a gem called Kuntzite, and we're, we're the only producer in the, in the United States of this gem. And so we get a number of other tourmalines and barrels and quartzes and things, but this is quite special, this thing here. The Empress Dowager of China had an affinity for pink, so much so that she was the main customer for pink tourmaline. It's reported that her purchases accounted for 120 tons of gem-grade material being mined between 1902 and 1910. They started right at the turn of the century, 1900, 1901, 1902. The early miners, they literally set the place on fire and they went out and staked out every square inch of Paula. The Empress would use the pink tourmaline for intricate carvings, fine jewelry, and buttons for jackets worn by her royal court. Yeah, this is known as the Southern California Gem Belt, and Paula's kind of in the middle of it. The pegmentites pop up in Paula. There's an eight square mile area here consisting of about 400 pegmentite dikes. And that's the tourmaline queen mine right there. Arguably the, some of the most valuable mineral specimens ever found in the world were found there in 1972 and they struck it rich. The find, blue cap tourmalines. Bill Larson and Brian Swoboda would add a chapter to the mineral legacy of this region. It's lost to history, but San Diego was a major gem cutting center, and it was once a big part of our history out here. A lot of people just don't know. It was last century, you know? However, you can still find your own shining souvenir from this mineral monument, and the best place to start is the fee dig. During the week, you can come dig and sift often you'll be rewarded. Oh, look, look. That's aquamarine. Wow, these are nice. Nice little tourmalines. But we're going after the more elusive pieces, the pieces the legends are made of. To find them, sometimes you'll need a little more firepower. Maybe like someplace we can never go again after this, or, or it might be viable after this. And we have indications of a pocket up here, like we were digging in yesterday. What we're going to do is we're going to take a chance here, and we're going to try to shoot this down. And it's either going to work or it's not going to work. And our hopes are here that we can knock down all this ugly rock, and then we'll have a place to dig. That's right. the last one to go off. So it's okay. going gonna, gonna, to do We're going to shave this rock off. Oh, OK, it's just going to go one at a time. Bam, 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 bam. Right, and it's going to take it down, but the question is, what's going to be left? Is it something we can't? It's, sometimes we do this, and you've got a beautiful place to work. Or maybe or there's a beautiful like pocket in there. My name is Darren Fissler. I've been uh, crazy about rocks ever since I was a little kid. The first rock I ever found, I was walking to school every day and I'd kick this rock. And uh, one day it popped up out of the ground. It was a great big quartz crystal. And from that point on, I was hooked on rocks. Tourmaline is really cool. And it's probably one of the rarest things that we find. You know, it's like anything else. You know, there's 
only so much of it you can find and we're always looking for it. And basically we're going to try to slap this ceiling down. Um, we have a lot of relief here so it shouldn't put too much pressure into, this, into the, the uh, spine. Uh, we're using uh, uh, dynamite in these charges and uh, they're put together with, uh, with the shock tube here and uh, this should all go these three at once and then this one last and should bring this whole piece down. Explosion goes. Get it. We got Reaction. 12 people here today. I want a head count before we shoot this. It's going right now. That was the top. Whoa! Oh. <laughs> Broke rock. The, the, the louder it is, the more it, less it does. Right. right. The more, that, that absorbed it, so that's what we wanted. All right. It smells like fireworks. <laughs> After the smoke cleared, it was time to poke around and see what we could uncover. So during the blast, there's been a lot of rock that's been fractured, and they're taking down all the rock that might be dangerous that could fall on somebody later on. Look at this, yeah. It didn't take long to come across evidence of what the mountain might hold. So this is uh, some large uh, quartz crystals here with uh, tourmaline in it. The black needles in here are tourmaline, so it's called tourmalated quartz. That was actually very effective. What we wanted it to do, it did exactly what we wanted it to do. We have a safe place to work in here now. Look at that one. Picking up crystals. Oh, that's a really nice one. That's a cool little specimen. It, it's you got to know what you're looking at. It's pretty ugly as it sits, but it'll clean up okay. Here we go. <laughs> so this what? is considered pretty bucket? clean for coming out of a mine. We do not carve or polish these, but this has to go back to the lab and be cleaned properly. And that'll be beautiful. You'll see these little tourmaline needles inside, which makes it. Or it's not ordinary quartz. This is a this is an interesting phenomenon, and it means there is tourmaline nearby. Okay, so we're gonna pick up whatever we can pick up and see if Whoa. we can pay for the powder. There's pocket falling out of the ceiling. That looks like oatmeal. Get out! Let's get out of there from the camp. That might have been a pocket that poured out. While we let the dust settle, we got a chance to check out how the minerals may clean up. So this is a really cute little specimen that just came out of the hole there. You can see it in the sun. It's really, you can see the tourmaline crystals in there. It's amazingly well preserved. There's no damage on it. That's a nice one. We have a saying around here, we take what the mountain gives us, and it gives us lots of different things, you know? Sometimes it's kunzite. Today, it gave us a beautiful little quartz specimen with tourmaline, tourmalated quartz. So we have this attitude that we take what the mountain gives us. and it, You just can't go looking for one thing and be disappointed all the time, you know? So as long as you have it in perspective that, hey, gave us a little crystal today, that pile's gotta be full of these. If we picked up this, just barely even looking, yeah. What we'll do is we'll dig it out with the bobcat and scatter it around on the ground, we'll let it rain on it, and then we'll probably find this probably, we'll probably be throwing this one away. I'm all for being grateful, but this was Pala, California, and there was one more mine I had to see. This area has produced top notch specimens in the past and it's where Jeff is placing his bets on the next big discovery. Fueled by his drive and curiosity, Jeff has been tearing through rock here for the better part of two decades. But every time you spot. shoot, you're, you're, you're advancing maybe four or five feet. Four and a half feet. You put in, what, a mile? You put tunnel? in about a mile of tunnel in 15 yeah. years. That's a lot of work. That's a yeah. lot of work, yeah. man. You followed the pegmatite vein 
right up over here, right? That's correct. That's yeah. exactly what determines this angle is we don't just say, oh, well, let's go this way. The pegmentite tells us we have to go that way. Right. When we do a counter a pocket, it's going to be sitting right on that contact as that one is, right. just above it. It See? looks like you found a pocket up there. Huh? Yeah, we found several of them up here. Um, that one we haven't finished digging. So what happens if you look at this pegmatite as it goes up? You know, he's able to read it from the colors in the iron or lithium contents, right. the beryllium contents, and the different minerals come out of this soup of the hot magma that was shooting through it, what, 100 million years ago, yep. in a different order. That streak right there is what you have to follow if you want to find anything of value. You're not going to find anything below that. And if you're up too high, you're also not gonna find anything. Well, we're standing in the very place where the earth cooked up an incredible treasure. So this is a pretty famous place right here, right? This is where we hit Kahuna 2 pocket, right where we're standing. And it was a significant find. The biggest Kunzite crystal ever taken off the continent. Oh my goodness. Yeah, it's a crystal it is. How much did you get out of here? Uh, like one ton. One ton? Of gem kunzite? A lot of it was gem, a oh, good wow. amount of it. How many tons of rock did you have to move to find that ton? Of I would bet it'd be every bit of a million tons. Wow, people have no idea what goes into finding the gems. <laughs> it's a real addiction, isn't yeah, it? it is. <laughs> Where you found your last one is the best place to be looking yeah. for your next one. This is where you're blasting today, right We're now. going this way another 100 right. feet. Yeah, we're going to go four feet today. The stakes are a little higher when dealing with more elusive minerals. The skill is understanding how much explosive power you need to get through the rock wall while minimizing the risk to the potentially valuable specimen. All right, we're getting ready for the explosion. They've drilled 33 holes that are four and a half feet deep each. They've packed them with ammonium nitrate with compressed air, and now they're connecting them all up so that they will go off in sequence a half a second apart each. So it's gonna, it's gonna be like, literally like Pac-Man chewing rock. It's just gonna go chomp, 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 chomp. And it's gonna have a beautiful tunnel in here. So what we're all hoping for now is that after this explosion, there will be some small pockets or hopefully even a big pocket exposed of gem minerals. I've been to hundreds of mines, but there's always a feeling of excitement waiting for a detonation knowing that after the boom, whoa, <laughs> a buried treasure may surface. All right, I done. saw rocks moving in there. All right, we have broken rock. The blast certainly was effective, moving Jeff's team four more feet into the earth. We've got a little pocket opened up here. You can, all of a sudden, it's much more mineralized than we've been seeing. There's a lot of uh, quartz and mica, and as they take all of this that was blown out of the wall, which he calls muck, and then they take it outside and they screen it to take out the big pieces, and then he lets the tourists go through the rest of it to see what they can find, and they continue working. Oh, I love the way this is looking. I absolutely love it. Finding world-class specimens is a rare occurrence one that takes many different elements of nature to come together in a certain way at a certain time. Fallbrook, California, about 30 minutes away, is home to one of the country's most well-known mineral explorers, Bill Larson. I was a kid in Minnesota, picked up uh, agates on the sides of uh, Lake Minnetonka, and then my dad uh, got tired of the snow. We moved out to California. My dad was in the avocado business, and. We, I could have never gone to school without a scholarship. So everything we've done is, you know, hard work and lots of travel. My father uh, knew a man who knew some of the mines, the Queen Mine, the Chief Mine, and uh, the Ocean View Mine. So we bought those on long term with a partner of mine. We had a 50-50 partnership, Ed Sabota, and none of us had any money particularly. 1972, the world changed for our company as we hit this blue cap pocket. John McLean, who's right over there, he uh, went to the right instead of straight down, and he hit a soft spot. And we came back, and, and we were looking at it, and within about three weeks, we got uh, back uh, maybe, uh, I don't know, 10 or 15 feet in this section, being careful not to dynamite very much, and we found a blue cap tourmaline. I'd never seen anything like it. It was about, about like this, like this, and a shiny, shiny 
indigo blue. The pocket went on and off and on and off for about maybe five weeks total. And we would mine and then all of a sudden it would just kind of pinch out and then John would go back in there and it would open up again. Well, I went up with my father uh, at night. I think it was about 10 o'clock at night by the time we got organized. And I remember driving up from the Stewart because you go up over a thousand feet. We're in a pickup truck and the lights are going into the fog, kind of a little misty fog. And we wind up at the mine and we go down to where John had opened up, probably down about 200 feet and to the right about uh, 30 feet. And there's this little opening like this, like this in the pegmatite and it's full of clay. And we start working on it and it's been shot with dynamite small around it. And we're able to pry a lot of things out. And we pull out a piece like this with a tourmaline here and a tourmaline here, and you can see where it's broken here. Big. These are shiny tops, but this one's missing. We had this thick clay and we're moving it out, and 18 inches in, we find the other tourmaline and our gloves, we wipe off the top and it fits perfectly, and that's called the candelabra. One, two, three, and if you see the Smithsonian, it's on display in the Smithsonian Institution. Now, we got the rest of the pocket worked out, but the word went all over the mineral world. Vince Manson, the curator at the time of the American Museum of Natural History, labeled it the find of the century for tourmaline. Probably 60 people came here to see the blue cap tourmalines in the back of my office up here, the Smithsonian. Uh, the British Museum was represented. And everybody wanted to buy some, but of course we didn't know what we were gonna price them at yet. But we, we figured it out, uh, Ed and I, and uh, we put $25,000 on the candelabra, which today is probably worth about, they estimate 10 to 20 million on that particular one, because it's world famous. But 25,000 was like a world record. I remember people cursing me and saying I had no conscience putting such a high price on a mineral specimen. I had to grow a beard because people wanted to deal with my father who was, you know, an avocado guy, <laughs> because they all want to deal with him instead of me. And I, no, no, it's me. I, I really am the guy that uh, likes the minerals. During Bill's world travels, he gained interest in exotic birds, soon starting a sanctuary. He also has an in-house artist who specializes in painting wildlife and mineral specimens. I don't know, I just keep on working till I get it right. <laughs> so. It looks to me like you got it right. <laughs> <laughs> He's most proud of turning his passion for rocks into a family business. This is from the ocean view, and this is a quartz specimen that I dug about four years ago. And it took me about four and a half hours uh, they don't normally come this clear in this size. They're normally smoky quartz or they're cracked and you can't do much. We've kept it as a specimen, but if you wanted to, you could make quite a carving out of it. My dad's generation and the one right behind him, uh, the guys who are in their 50s now, they kind of had the golden age of mining where you didn't have to go deep as deep in the ground to find minerals. Now we are finding less in today's mining world and so we're seeing things that might have cost in the 80s $10 are now $1,000 because the supply is shrinking, the demand is growing. The demand for mineral specimens is increasing, and with each piece comes a storied history, one that Bill has agreed to show us firsthand. You know, there is something probably magical about Oh this my goodness, case. look at that. This is a really nice aquamarine. That is pictured in the uh, article on the Ocean View Mine as the finest aquamarine that was oh, that's uh, Ocean View. produced. Oh, cool. These are tourmalines that we mined uh, from 1977 through uh, 1997, over a 20-year period at the Himalayan Mine. Beautiful with Clevelandite, Lepidolite, perfectly terminated, complex, many colors. Here's a <laughs> book that George F. Coons did write. And uh, this is written in 1906. And uh, here's the Kunzite. If oh, you'll wow. put it on there, you'll notice it's one to one. Wow, it's perfectly on there. It's from a gouache with, uh, done by Tiffany and Company. And here's the picture that Kunz had taken of him with that Kunzite. And this is the original, it came out of his estate. And there you can see the absolutely the same, it's the same, like same Kunzite. Yeah. yeah. Pretty, pretty exciting piece of history. If you were up in uh, the Ocean View mine, Here's one that he calls the Big Kahunas. This is the largest one that we know of from North America, yeah, but this has got a color. So this is pure gem quality of the utmost finest color. 
Bill undoubtedly has one of the top collections in the world. From Morganites to Kunzites, he has it all, including a piece rarely seen in person. So here's, I guess, the most famous piece and what put us on the map in 1972. Oh my God. This is one of the <laughs> tourmalines. Oh my goodness. Like the one in the Smithsonian. I don't want to hold it. Yeah, this is, you know, beautiful, natural polish. Uh, this is just the way God made it. This is the side that he's holding. So the thumb is here and the two fingers back there. Mm -hmm. See? Okay. It's up here. It's up. It's about there, yeah. Holding American history in my hand, I'm reminded of how these pieces reflect more than just their natural beauty. They're symbols of the people and cultures who dedicate their lives to sharing the beauty of the world around us. If you want to see more episodes or check out our mineral collection, click the link in the description. And of course, like and subscribe to our channel. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time on Mineral Explorers.